Yes, go ahead. Yeah. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you under the name of Jesus. We thank you for this beautiful day and for the beautiful class that we are about to have where we are going to learn more about you and learn more what we can do so that we can glorify your name and your kingdom, God. God, I give a Pastor Deepika into your hands. Be with her and guide her throughout the session. Uh, God, I pray that each and every one of the students who is going to listen and who will be listening to this class later I pray that uh, they will open their mind and heart and listen to each and every word, not just listen to it, but we will be the doer of the word that we listen. I pray for everyone who's on the way to join the class. I pray that uh, everyone across the world uh, will get the good Wi-Fi connection that they need so that they can listen to your word from the starting till the end and be blessed on this life. Be with us and guide us. Let your Holy Spirit uh, take over this class. Help us to understand more about you throughout the session. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Yes, let's get started. Um, so last class was our introductory class on holiness. And um, um, we saw that generally God takes us through a three-step process. Uh, we receive a revelation with the help of the Holy Spirit about God's holiness. And then we respond to it. There are some who respond wrongly. But then those who respond uh, in the correct manner, uh, the Lord will begin to prepare them you know, to become holy so he will work in their lives so first there is a revelation then is then there's a response from our side and then god will work in us to make us holy uh, so that we can share in his holiness uh, so it is revelation response and then god working in us to reproduce his holiness in us and then it will become evident to the people around us uh, it will be revealed they will begin to see God's holiness in us. So these are all the terms that we would see in our textbook, you know. Uh, so even as we are doing these classes, uh, just make sure that you keep going through the uh, class notes as well. It will be like a kind of revision uh, because many of the things that we are talking about here will be, uh, you know, in the notes. Uh, so uh, it's so just to mention it again, revelation and then our response to the revelation of the Holy Spirit and then uh, his work in us to reproduce his holiness in us and then that begins to get revealed to the people around us who can see that here is a person who is set apart they are choosing to live in a way that honors God uh, so God takes each of us through this process uh, for some of us who, who uh, whose responses are quick and who are uh, willing to repent quickly and uh, willing to fall in line with whatever he is saying for us the process would be quicker uh, but then for those of us who are uh, more slow in our obedience uh, more slow in placing our trust in the lord and just surrendering to him uh, for for such uh, people uh, we would find it you know uh, more difficult it will probably take longer but we all are engaged in that process we all are going to be receiving a revelation from the holy spirit again and again regarding different facets of this topic uh, of holiness and we will all be responding either positively or negatively to the things that he is specifically revealing to us and based on the way we are responding either there would be a long wait you know, where God will just wait for us to come round to the right response. Or if we have been all day, we have, if we are responding in the right way, we will be able to move into those things because he will begin to, um, through his Holy Spirit, through his power, he will begin to make those changes in us so that our nature will become more and more like his. Okay, so um, this um, three-step process, or if you, okay, if you want to call it a four-step process, uh, is something that we all will be experiencing and going through. Uh, even as we do this course. Now, uh, just to move into today's session, which will mainly be based on chapter two of your notes. Uh, so um, just to touch upon some things that we could not cover last time, um, we uh, it would be good if we can look very specifically at the Isaiah chapter six passage uh, and some of the things that are mentioned there. And then from there, we will move into other things. So uh, right now, if we could turn in our Bibles to Isaiah chapter 6, and then uh, you know, just um, uh, to kind of keep people involved, 
I would ask you guys to read out the verses and uh, you know it it would just be one verse or two verses and it seems rather unnecessary I know uh, because I can quite well read it myself but then if you know uh, if one of you could um, you know read it out it also kind of gives me the assurance that there are people sitting there and actually watching and listening uh, you know um, so uh, if someone could uh, maybe read out Isaiah chapter 6 verse 1 and let us see uh, what is revealed to us in this particular verse. Isaiah 6, verse 1, if we, if we could have someone read out, please. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Yes. Uh, what Isaiah sees uh, is he sees the Adonai, uh, that's the term that he that that pops into his mind when he looks at the Lord. He doesn't just see him as God, the provider or, you know, uh, God, the, uh, the uh, commander in chief, you know, the victor in battle. He sees him as Adonai, as his master. OK, so um, uh, he immediately recognizes that he must, uh, you know, bow down and submit and surrender to this Adonai. Uh, and this is some an experience that everyone in humanity is going to have, you know, in the last day uh, when, when, the, when the Lord appears. It says, you know, every knee shall bow. Uh, God is a lot of things. I mean, there are so many facets to his personality and his nature and his character and who he is. Uh, but the immediate response is, every knee will bow because they will recognize that this is the ultimate Adonai. He is the creator. He is the one who has made everything and everyone and they all are subject to him. So at that, uh, on that day, even those who do not like it will be forced to bow the knee because they would have to acknowledge that he is the creator. And they all are just created beings, and they have to fall in, you know, uh, in line with what he is saying. Uh, so, um, more than anything, uh, that it would be the immediate response of any uh, human, uh, or, or in fact, even the angels, or in fact, even the demons. They would have to finally bend and say, "Yes, this is Adonai, the Master, the Lord." Okay, so uh, that is how um, Isaiah sees uh, this. Um, see, sees the Lord seated on His throne, and then there's another statement that is made uh, right here in this opening verse uh, of what he sees. Uh, he says, "I saw the Lord high and exalted, uh, as in um, there's nobody higher than Him, um, he, because I mean He is the other, the unique one." Um, uh, whatever he has made, uh, he has endowed certain qualities in us. He has put certain attributes, you know, uh, uh, which we now carry. All of that is just a little part of him. Uh, but he is completely uh, high and exalted. And uh, there's nothing more than him. There's nothing beyond him. And uh, so it says he, he recognizes immediately that this God is not only Adonai and Lord, he is also high and exalted. Uh, there is nobody higher. There is nothing that can exalt and rise above him and take control of him or you know, force him to bend uh, to their ways. So he recognizes that. And in line with that, it also says the train of his robe filled the temple. Now, uh, this phrase sounds very mysterious to us. Uh, but then, you know, when it, um, Isaiah wrote this in those days, his readers would have been very comfortable with the phrase. They would have understood what is being said, uh, because that's basically what was happening, um, you know, in, um, in their uh, scenario in the, in the Mediterranean region, in the ancient world, uh, where you would have uh, rulers going out uh, to conquer other territories. And uh, when they go and defeat another uh, you know, uh, nation, and that nation comes under their control, this king who has conquered, the conqueror, uh, he would, um, all of these kings, they 
wore they wore this you know the the the, the robe would have a, a long uh, stretch of cloth hanging behind like we have our superman and uh, nowadays you know who has that flying cape behind him uh, which of course is quite short uh, but yeah all those kings in those days would have this long piece of cloth hanging off their shoulders and you know kind of uh, trailing behind them and um, that is just a symbol of their power to show how high and exalted each of them is uh, a, a, a king who is not really very powerful who has not really conquered many lands uh, would at least he's supposed to have a shorter train okay he's supposed his is the the length of the uh, the of the uh, cloth hanging off his shoulders would have to be shorter in length uh, but uh, over time what would happen is that as he goes around conquering other lands he cuts off a portion of the defeated king's robe uh, of that you know the train of cloth that is hanging behind he cuts it off and he attaches a portion of that to his own robe to show that now he is the conqueror and now this person whom he has defeated is now a subject tribute that person would have to be paying um, you know um, money to him and uh, gold and silver to him on a regular basis otherwise he'll come with his army and attack them again and and, and you know create havoc in their land uh, so um, it it's a show of uh, power it's a show of how much authority uh, this this particular conqueror holds and so uh, during the ceremonies you know when the king would come out in all of his glory in front of the people and the public would would see him walking by he would at that time wear this thing and the longer it is and the number of uh, you know attachments there are to this particular thing, the people would see that and say, wow, our ruler is really very, very powerful because based on the train of his robe uh, and all the attachments which have you know, been attached, it shows how many lands he has subjugated and how much he has conquered. And so here is a king uh, who is unconquerable. He is high and exalted. He is above all else. Uh, so, you know, it this um is what that uh, the the train of the robe represented and um, uh, isaiah who is aware of this uh, you know uh, who was living in that culture of that times uh, his eyes immediately go to that robe and he sees that here is the train of a robe that is filling the entire temple which you know basically is bringing out the point uh, that um, our god has conquered all he is conqueror over everything. Everything is in subjection to him. Nothing is higher than him. Nothing is more exalted than him. Uh, so uh, these are the first initial things that Isaiah catches when he is uh, when he sees you know uh, the Lord seated on his throne, um, and then in verse, how the others are um, you know responding to God's presence. And uh, so we have these angels, the seraphim who are standing there and they are crying out to each other and saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. And they're saying the whole earth is full of his glory. Um, uh, they are not uh, saying that, yeah, here in his temple, he is glorious. Uh, and yeah, in those places, in the land of Israel, where at least some people are following him and worshipping him, there he is glorious. They are not saying that. They are saying his glory fills the entire earth. There are um, uh, many, many uh, pockets here on this earth where people are uh, have not yet submitted to him, not yet surrendered to him. But his glory is prevailing over there because he is giving them time. He is being patient with them. He is allowing them to uh, to come to him, to discover him, uh, because he is a loving and compassionate God. His glory is very much present even in those dark places, uh, and because he is being patient, he doesn't want to um, you know hurl his judgment onto those lands, but. Uh, you know, just because he is allowing the wicked to have their way for a little while, it does not mean that he is uh, not in charge. His glory prevails throughout the earth. He is the conqueror uh, who is in perfect control of everything. 
um, if any wickedness anywhere is still being allowed, it's only because in his divine uh, wisdom, uh, in his all-knowing nature, he has allowed it uh, because he has some greater purpose in mind. Uh, to use a very good example, he allowed the cross, the crucifixion to happen. Where imagine divinity is being allowed to be humiliated, to be humbled. And why would he allow something like that? Because he knows in that act of humiliation and humbling, <laughs> there's actually an am amazing uh, uh, victory which is hidden. I mean, for, to humans and the demons which were watching Christ on the cross, they were, it, it was like, um, you know, God being uh, brought down low, but God knew all along what is actually going on. Something was being accomplished in the spiritual realm, an ultimate victory, which the demons were not even aware of. And we humans could not recognize. We were too blind to see. So his glory was prevailing on the cross when all of that humbling was going on. Uh, so, uh, so this is something that these uh, seraphim recognize and they constantly cry out and they say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord almighty, not just little mighty, almighty, because the whole earth is full of his glory. OK, so which is why, you know, some of us who are living in countries and regions uh, where it looks like as if the uh, the wicked are having their way uh, they seem to be wielding all the power and the influence and the church is so uh, uh, you know uh, limited and we feel that oh we are so um, uh, weak uh, we don't we are not able to you know defend our rights and we are not able to have uh, good lives uh, we need to recognize that the whole earth including these areas where we are living are full of his glory and he is high and exalted and uh, uh, he is in control and so in his time he will do whatever is required for his church for his people uh, and if there is any delay it is a divine delay which he has planned because he has something greater in mind so we can always have this confidence uh, so when isaiah sees God in his um, Adonai ship, you know, in his and in his completely exalted and sovereign uh, position. And when he sees him in all of his holiness, his response in verse five, uh, if someone could read out Isaiah chapter six, verse five, please. Isaiah chapter six, verse five. Oh, to me, I cried, I'm ruined, for I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Amen. So a godly man like Isaiah, immediate, his immediate response is that he is unclean. I mean, here is not a man who was living in sin. He was not a rebel. Uh, he is one who loved God and kept his ways. but. Once he stood in the presence of the holiness of God, he immediately recognized that he is not up to the mark. And he recognizes how much below the mark he actually is. And that horrifies him. And he says, I am ruined, you know, as in I am finished. I mean, I thought that I had achieved something. I thought I had reached some level of, uh, you know, acceptability in the eyes of God. But I have nothing. My goodness, look at him seated over there in all of his perfection. And what am I, whatever I have done so far to make myself acceptable in his eyes is nothing. I've not even started. I'm nowhere. I'm finished. I'm ruined is his immediate recognition. And then that is his response. So you see, there was a revelation. His eyes were opened and through the Holy Spirit, he saw the king seated over there. And where the, once that revelation of the Holy Spirit came through to him, his immediate re response was that he recognized how fallen he was. And he realized that he is truly ruined and finished. There's nothing that he can ever do that would kind of maybe lift him up a little higher and making him a little more acceptable to God. No, he's finished. He's ruined. And then when he recognizes who he is, then God is able to work in him. And then God is able to lift him up and place him, you know, in a position of 
righteousness and holiness and that's exactly what god goes on to do uh, and so uh, you know uh, his symbolically his lips are touched with that live coal um, as in symbolically burning away all the uncleanness of his lips uh, and why is it talking about unclean lips uh, what about all the other things that we do you know aren't those unclean as well um, i think this is kind of based on that principle you know uh, which jesus talks about out of the abundance of the heart everything else comes out the thoughts we think in our mind the attitudes we have you know towards different things and towards people um, the choices that we make it all comes out of that abundance of the heart whatever the heart is full of you know the overflow from that can be seen in all areas in in our thinking our speech our actions our choices in all of that and so here um the unclean lips the lips are unclean because the heart is still unclean and so when that coal is used to symbolically touch the lips and and burn away the 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 rot the filth um in a way it's a symbolically saying that inside on the inside your heart is now being cleansed it is being purified by the fire of the lord okay so um uh, oh, oh, so what is done for him that live coal is more a symbol but there is a spiritual reality behind it where uh, the holy spirit uh, cleansed isaiah on the inside uh, by his divine fire okay so uh, we need to understand it in that sense and uh, so uh, after that encounter isaiah walks away from that uh, and uh, uh, he be he begins his ministry based on that revelation and uh, in the same way all of us should be living our lives our christian lives based on those kind of encounters because those are encounters where we saw him for who he is and we saw ourselves for who we are and then we saw his work of love and mercy in lifting us out of that pathetic condition and you know placing us in a better place and those encounters uh, will bring meaning and purpose into the way we live the rest of our day to day lives and so we need a a lot of those encounters uh, you know on a regular basis now they will not be as uh, as spectacular and grand as uh, what happened with isaiah not all the time uh, because um, then we would be living more um, uh, you know in the in the in the spiritual realm and um, where everything is bigger grander but no you know the curtain is still there and we are still god is we are still here in the natural realm where god you know wants us to live by faith uh, not uh, not see everything there is to see behind the curtain yet uh, so we will not always constantly every day be having these spectacular encounters but in that little time that we spend with the lord you know that one hour or so that we just you know spend in his presence we will have little little encounters where some particular scripture will just jump out of the pages at us and you know catch us in our spirit and say let's say wow this is what god is saying to me this day and we need those encounters so isaiah lived the rest of his days um with an awareness of this encounter uh, he had been burnt in that encounter you know uh, and that uh, the uh, uh, when i used when i used the term uh, scar maybe the scar would be a very negative word the imprint of that encounter uh, always stayed because you know when he is writing his uh, book the book of isaiah 27 times he mentions that god is holy i mean again and again that keeps coming back to him because you see he had that encounter he experienced it um both in his spirit and physically he just experienced it and now he cannot forget it uh, so uh, even as we are living out our lives whether we are in ministry or whether you know we have uh, secular jobs wherever we are living i mean or whatever wherever god has placed us uh, it would really help if we can have these encounters on a day to day basis and that is why it is so important to go into his presence uh, you know to lock the door and just sit over there uh, for a little while uh, so that he can talk to us and he only opens himself up to people who are really interested if i am just you know if i'm just going through a ritual and i want to uh, finish my one chapter of reading and move out it's okay fine you do that 
but a day will come when you will want to be in my presence longer and when you do that that day i will reveal something of myself to you so you know god is patient um so uh, if we choose to spend time with him he will reveal something of himself to us uh, every day every time that we go to into his presence there would be something sometimes it may not be something new it may just be a reminder of what he has already told us on some other day but there's always this this um this contact between him and us and when we walk away having had that contact uh, the effect of that stays the rest of the day uh, in the choices that we make in the way we treat people uh, and all of that so it's very very important uh, isaiah we see here uh, was uh, uh, was touched and changed by that encounter which he had and uh, that probably would have caused him to keep going back into god's presence daily you know and he would have had his other little little encounters um, you know on a daily basis i'm sure so um let us uh, walk in the in the light in the power of these daily encounters that we are having with our lord otherwise we kind of get uh, detached disconnected and um, we start thinking the way the world thinks and we live in the way the world lives uh, uh, so we need to stay connected and this time of devotions that we have in private with the lord helps a lot it goes a long way in building up this relationship so that we we are uh, we, we we spend the rest of the day in this in, in an awareness of his presence you know it kind of helps a lot and um, this whole thing about being holy even as the lord is holy he says you know right uh, in the scriptures we see that he says uh, uh, be holy even as i am holy um, and it seems like a very um, heavy demand upon us and um, uh, it seems a very tiresome responsibility to live up to uh, but that is not what god meant uh, holiness to be and um, sometimes when we are trying to understand the lord uh, you know we use these rather silly examples and the reason we use these silly examples is we are trying to explain in human terms something that is divine something that um, is sometimes beyond our human understanding so uh, you know whenever we try to use examples to explain something in the scripture um, we have to accept that there are limitations to the example that we are using okay so these is not exactly great examples but i'm just uh, want to use one example to try and bring out what god actually wanted when he said you know be holy as i am holy um he was just trying to share his holiness with us um you know uh, so coming to my rather <laughs> silly example uh you know picture this little child you know you 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 would have seen you know little, little little girls who stand in front of the mirror and they you know they wear their pretty frock their pretty, their pretty little dress and and they kind of you know uh, posing in front of it and uh, you know seeing how pretty they look and you know they have this little tiara you know you know that little shiny thing with the with the plastic stones and it, it glitters and shiny and looks nice of course it doesn't have much value uh, but you know for them they 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 put that little crown on their heads and you know they pretend that they are a princess and uh, uh, so uh, this child you know she comes up to you and she says you know auntie i'm i'm going to share my tiara with you you can wear it for some time and she puts it on your head and you know, because uh, she she knows that she's beautiful when she's wearing that tiara and she wants to share that beauty with you so you know she puts the tiara on your Your head, and she says, "There now, you know, you can also be beautiful for some time." You know, so she is, um, uh, and when she does that, when she puts that tiara on your head, you don't say, "Oh my goodness, another tiresome headache to bear, another burden to endure." You don't say that because that would be totally missing the point, and you would not say, "Oh, this plastic little thing, what do I care about it?" You you don't think you don't say any of those things because. you're catching what the child is offering she is taking that is something that is so precious to her something that makes her look beautiful and perfect and she wants to share that with you because you are important to her you are her aunt and so she takes that tiara and she places it on your head and you catch what she's you know doing what she's offering and you say wow this child wants to share her beauty with me you know and we that is what the lord this immensely great 
sovereign, exalted, high Adonai who is sitting there on his throne and where the angels are like crying out and saying, holy, 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 that God wants to share that holiness with us. I mean, we are a bunch of people who before salvation used to trample on that holiness. You know, we were spitting on that holiness. We didn't even care about him. And now, you know, because we have repented and we are sorry for what we have done and we really want to change and we have called out to him and said, Lord, I want to be changed. You help me, Lord. You work in my life. Because we said that now, now he loves us and he wants to lavish all of himself on us. And so he's not thrusting his beauty upon us like some kind of a, um, burden that has to be borne. Imagine he's sharing the beauty of his holiness with us. You know, we saw that last time. We saw that um, these different uh, metaphors that we use, they express different parts of uh, his nature. Uh, uh, for instance, when we say hand of the Lord, we're talking about the power of God. When we say uh, the eyes of the Lord, we're talking about how he can see everything. He is all knowing. And so in the same way, when we say uh, beauty of the Lord, you know, we're talking about holiness so it's the it's his holiness which brings out his beauty his attractiveness and he wants to share that beauty with us so it's actually an immense privilege that he is giving us yes it is a responsibility as well uh, but it's not just a burden that has been pushed off onto us rather it is something that out of his heart out of his love you know what is there you know he could have just you know, placed us in a position where we are a bunch of forgiven sinners. I mean, that itself, we would be really grateful that we uh, have been forgiven, even though, you know, we, there was no way we could earn the forgiveness. We have just been given the forgiveness freely. And we could have been, we could have settled for that and we have been happy with it. But uh, he, he doesn't just want to leave us in that position of just forgiven sinners. He wants us to make him like him. He wants to share his beauty with us so it's not a burden that is being thrust upon us rather it's a privilege that we are um, being uh, given that we can share in his very nature and uh, because we are living in this world and we still have the flesh you know which is active it becomes a responsibility we we don't automatically um, become holy uh, we have to um, make a choice and sacrifice the, the things which are dishonoring God and, you know, uh, step into each level of holiness on a day to day basis. So in that sense, yes, it becomes a serious responsibility and it involves sacrifice and all of that. But ultimately, he's not doing it to make us unhappy or miserable. He's doing it to make us beautiful. He wants us to be as beautiful as him. And so, you know, um, the angels, they will not only recognize that God is holy, they will look at us humans who are just humans and they know all about us, they know our weaknesses, they know what we are. And they look at us and they, and they think, wow, these people, these humans are sharing in his holiness. We are catching glimpses of him in these created humans. And it's an amazing thing that God would want to share that his very own nature with us. Okay, so even as we are doing this course, uh, the reason I spent so many minutes on this is I want us to see this whole topic of holiness not as a burden that has to be endured, but rather as this privilege where God is saying, come, I'm inviting you into this to come and share in my very nature with me. And then all my angels, when they look at you, they'll, they'll catch a glimpse of me and they'll think, wow. You know, I was standing there before the throne and crying out, holy, holy, when I saw that aspect of his holiness. And now I'm catching a glimpse of that in this human, in this mere human. I'm catching the same a glimpse of that holiness in this person. Uh, and so God is saying, I want to share myself with you. OK, so um, uh, it is going to involve sacrifice. It is difficult, but it is something beautiful that he's trying to do for us. Okay, so he's doing it out of the goodness and lavishness and generosity of his heart. And we should approach it uh, from that sense. We should, you know, um, um, we should accept it as something, uh, a privilege that is being given to us. Um, so uh, 
coming to this uh, you know holiness of god um, you know some more aspects of it um, isaiah 43:15 if someone could read out please isaiah 43:15 Isaiah chapter 43, Isaiah. verse 15. I am the Lord, your Holy One, Israel's Creator, your King. Yes. Uh, so here, uh, you know, of course, this is just one verse among a lot of verses which talk about the holiness of God. Uh, but, you know, he says, I am the Lord, your Holy One. Okay, so he's the... Um, and, and he goes on to say, the creator of Israel, your king, you know. So these are all uh, terms of authority that are being used. And uh, among these terms of authority uh, is the description of, of what this uh, figure of authority is like. What kind of an authority figure is he? He is a holy one. So he is the ultimate standard of holiness. Um, now, you know, especially in our uh, the world that we live in today, people have different ideas about what spiritual spirituality is and they all all have different ideas of what holiness is but there's one ultimate standard of what holiness is and that is the creator who made us and made everything so he gets to decide exactly what holiness is okay so um, he is the standard to uh, uh, to which we need to look and which we need to imitate and uh, 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 settling for other definitions of holiness, you know, human definitions of holiness will not do. They are not good enough. Uh, so he is the ultimate uh, standard of holiness. He says, I am the Lord. And the word over there is, is the word, uh, you know, uh, Yahweh, uh, you know, I am that I am. That's the term that is used over there. Uh, that y, YW, uh, HW that, you know, we use in our English translations. That's the term used over there. In our English uh, Bibles, wherever we see L-O-R-D in caps, you know, um, it, that's the translation. They're trying to translate YW, HW into, uh, you know, an English term. So wherever you have L-O-R-D in caps, uh, the translation is basically uh, the Hebrew word, uh, Yahweh, which is being translated into English. In other places where you have capital L and you have a small O-R-D, that's uh, generally Adonai. Adonai is being translated into English as Lord. Okay, so um, just so that we can, you know, have an understanding of that. Uh, so uh, he is the ultimate standard of holiness that we are meant to live up to. Now, coming to these angels and them, you know, standing over there and saying, holy, holy, holy. Why didn't they just say it two times? Why didn't they say it four times? Uh, you know, they could have said holy, 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 holy four times. Or they could have just said holy, holy and left it at that. Why three times? It's just that God was speaking to a Israelite. I mean, you know, uh, Isaiah, uh, who belonged to that culture and who understood the numeral three in a particular way. Okay, so in their culture, um, uh, you know, holy, 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 uh, the word, the, the, the number three, three uh, denotes completeness okay so all that um, uh, the angels are trying to bring out is the fact that his holiness is complete um, nothing more can be added to him to make him more holy uh, he is already complete so which is why we say he's the ultimate standard of holiness uh, there's nothing greater that you can do to uh, that someone can do to make themselves more holy than god nor can they represent holiness in a different way using some other method no uh, he is uh, complete holiness uh, in all of its wholeness and entirety he represents holiness uh, so the, the the wherever the, the wherever a phrase is used uh, thrice uh, it is it is used at least in in the in the you know, israelite culture that's the way they would depict completeness and wholeness okay so um, so here we have the seraphim who cry out and say holy 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 and the same term uh, you know uh, terminology is used again in revelation chapter 4 verse 8 so not only in isaiah's time were the seraphim saying that even when when we go to the end times uh, and uh, we all, you know, get to stand over there uh, in God's presence. At that time, we would still see the, um, the you know, those living creatures saying, 
holy, 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 uh, because they are uh, trying to bring out the completeness of his holiness, the perfection uh, of his holiness. Um, now, uh, you know, just for us to uh, understand a little bit about, about uh, the the Hebrews, how they expressed themselves, you know, in writing. Um, when uh, in, in, in at least in our, in our English, we have uh, what we would call a superlative. Uh, so you would have a, a good boy, you would have a better boy, and you would have the best. Uh, so uh, the best would be the superlative. Now in their Hebrew language, they did not they did not have a superlative. So what they would do is they would repeat the same word twice, you know, to depict um, um, the superlative. And we will actually look at some examples so that we know we have we would have a clearer understanding of the way Hebrews write. So when we are looking at the scriptures, you know, it's we are looking at scriptures which were written by those people in their language at that time, with the understanding that they had for those particular phrases, right? So uh, we who have been who are now living uh, many thousands of years later, sometimes we don't catch what they are saying because um, we are not living in their culture and we're not familiar with their language. So once we begin to understand uh, the way their language functions and way, the way they cultural talk, uh, the way they, they, they spoke in their culture, it becomes easier for us to you know, understand certain things. Uh, so which is why we're just doing this. Um, let's, uh, if someone, if we could have someone uh, read out Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 24, please. Ecclesiastes 7, 24. There was this brother who began to read at that time, and then uh, he, if he's still here, maybe he can read, or we can have whoever. Yeah, just anyone can go ahead. Ecclesiastes seven twenty four. Ecclesiastes seven verse twenty four. As for that which is far off and exceedingly deep, who can find it out? Okay, so here in our English Bible. Uh, we have the wording that which is far off and exceedingly deep who can find it okay so in our hebrew bible i mean if we were to you know uh, literally uh, read what it says over there in the hebrew language it would be something like as for that which is far off and uh, the hebrew word is amok okay the hebrew word for deep is amok so basically in the hebrew bible uh, you know you can actually go to bible hub and you know just look up the verse and then you will be able to see that in bible hub it will show you the actual hebrew wording and the greek wording for the new testament uh, so if you look over there it, it would read as uh, as for that which is far off and amok amok that word amok amok is used twice to say exceedingly amok you know very very amok very very deep so uh, they would repeat the same phrase twice to show that uh, something is deep. On the other hand, you know, um, if they had written a mock, a mock, a mock thrice, it would mean the deepest. It can't be deeper than that, which I guess is um, not a very feasible thing to say because, you know, infinity, something can keep going deeper and deeper and deeper. Uh, yeah, because of infinity. But yeah, you know, so if, if a mock had been, had been um, mentioned thrice, so it twice, is to bring out the superlative. If something is mentioned thrice, that would mean complete. It's complete. It can't get more complete than that. It's fully complete in that sense. Uh, just to look at another one example, um, uh, Numbers chapter 14, verse 7, if someone could read out. Numbers 14, 7. Numbers chapter 14 verse 7 and said to the entire Israelite assembly the land we passed through and explored is exceedingly good okay so here the Hebrew word for good would be mayod okay mayod is the Hebrew word so in our Hebrew Bible if we were to be reading it literally it would be the land we passed through and explored is mayod mayod good land Okay, the word good is also used over the word tov. Tov is good. So it says mayod, mayod, good. 
land so um, uh, it's like you know saying um, very very good exceedingly good okay is the is the uh, oh the, the word mayot means very much so um, it's it's like a superlative superlative being used over there very much very much good land okay is is what is being said over there so in all these more in all these examples that we see in the bible mainly you you will have the phrase you being used twice superlative but um even it is used three times like in the case of holy 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 then it is saying it's ultimate it can't get more um, uh, you know um, greater than than that so that would be the uh, ultimate expression of that particular phrase whatever is being said uh, and uh, in the bible we only have uh, holy 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 being used in that sense uh, yeah uh, okay so having understood uh, that this is the level of holiness that the seraphim are talking about um, let's go into other aspects um, let's look at psalm 105 verse 3 uh, we still have a little time before our break so we can actually fit this in uh, if, if we could have someone read out psalm 105 verse 3 please Psalm 105 verse 3, glory in his name, let the heart of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Okay, so first of all, um, uh, here we see that God's name is being described as holy. And then second, it says that we must glory in this holy name. Uh, now, uh, the Hebrew word uh, used over here uh, is, you know, that word for um, glory. Uh, it's it's basically the word halal. Okay, uh, halal literally means to shine, and here it says that we should um, shine in his uh, in his holy name. In this, uh, so it doesn't literally mean shine over here. It means uh, we must boast in it. We must you know just um, praise and wallow in it in this holy name. Uh, so in that sense, so the word halal is also generally used, you know, as as praise. Uh, so, um, so we are supposed to just glory and just, you know, just boast and brag and shine in his holy name, because this is a name that we can trust completely because it's a, it is a holy name. It's not imperfect. Uh, he will not, uh, deceive us. He will not betray, uh, our trust in him. He's not that kind of a God. He's holy. His name is holy. Uh, his name represents who he is, his character. So we know that he is perfectly holy. So he, so we can really boast and be confident and stand in this name and shine in it and declare it, because those who come to him in his name uh, will not be rejected. They will not be put to shame. In the end, at the uh, trials will come, difficulties will be there, the answer may be delayed, but in the end, that name that character or, you know, of who he is, it will, you know, um, establish for us what is needed for our lives. God will be faithful. He will never be unfaithful. So we can literally halal, shine, brag, boast, be confident and establish ourselves, our lives in his name. Why? Because his name is holy. He will never do anything that will... Um, that would, um, you know, mar, that would corrupt this holiness, this perfection of who he is. He would never lower his standard. So which is why that gives us confidence. Um, yeah, uh, we'll, we'll come back now after the break and look at some more scriptures, you know, regarding the holiness of God. Uh, so um, at 11 o'clock sharp, you know, if uh, we can all uh, log back in, we will again resume the class at 11 o'clock. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pastor.